Hello, everyone, and welcome to another powerful panel as part of the Open Business Council Summit. The topic of this panel today is continued learning, data, research, educational technology, tech as the enabler. My name is Elise Quevedo, and I will be your moderator today. I am joined by an esteemed panel, which includes Mr. Adit Malik, tech entrepreneur, CEO and MD at Talent Touch, one of the leading new age technology-driven interactive education companies. We've got Professor Yu Xiong, Chair of Business Analytics, Associate Dean International, and Director of the Center for Innovation and Commercialization at Starry University. We have Dr. Jamal Bonish, Professor and Chair in Business Analytics at the University of Edinburgh Business School. And we also have joining us today, Dr. Nguyen Bing Trong, who is a pivotal researcher at the Data Science Institute at Imperial College London. Thank you all for joining us. And before we start, just a quick note. I encourage all viewers to follow these amazing individuals, social channels, and get inspired by your insights and stories, as today we have a short time with you all. The full names are being shared on the chat comments, I believe, so a quick Google search and you will be able to be connected with everyone. And of course, you can follow myself and the Open Business Council channels too. With that said, Something that we can all agree on is that regardless of the challenges of the last year, technology in education has been crucial. Digital and data continues to be part of a big shift in the current and in the future of continued learning. Learning itself is essential to our development as human beings, since we're children just like food fuels our bodies, information, data, knowledge and skills, are part of the continued learning that fuels our minds. But we are far away from the days of just learning from encyclopedias, physical books, and your traditional classrooms. Technology has been enabling a brand new way of discovery. So let's just start right there. For our first question, and this is directed to all the panelists, I would like to understand your point of view on what does technology as the enabler mean to you? Let's begin with Mr. Malik. Thank you, um, Elise, and um, glad to be here as part of the panel along with my um, esteemed colleagues on the panel. Um, for us, the way I look at it as running a tech company, the technology as an enabler is a means to getting to the last mile and the last person on the ground. From an edtech perspective, one of the strengths which uh, technology brings to education, it's a great leveler. You know, you can give a education the same quality of education to a person sitting in a remote corner of India, Africa, or any other nation in a village, what you can get in the top Ivy League college in the world. To me, that's what technology as an enabler means, ensuring that the last mile connectivity, ensuring that the last mile learner experience, ensuring that the person who cannot afford to travel to the top Ivy League college gets the same level of education what that person sitting in that remote corner of the world is getting it. And that's where I feel um, you know, technology as an enabler can play and is playing a big role in ensuring the true uh, democratization of education as we go forward. That is a great kick of answer. So let's continue with the same question to Dr. Jamal. Uh, hi, Elisa. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, technology as the enabler, uh, in my opinion, is a generic statement. Uh, so in its generic form, uh, it means the use of technology uh, enables innovation in the delivery of higher quality products and services. In the case of education, however, it means a more effective and efficient learning experience, and one that is ideally customized to the needs of each learner or each group or category of learners. I love the way that we're kicking this off. And I would love to see the, hear the insights from Professor Sion. 
Um, thank you. Well, I think that's a very uh, interesting question, how we view the technology, how it's role to su support uh, our behaviors, so, uh, improve the society. Um, so I would think that um, uh, the technology uh, should um, uh, assist we to achieve our goal. Uh, so because um, uh, many people worry that the technology sometimes may hurt the human society. And if we talk about AI, and many people worry about AI may, 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 be, uh, may be very risky, right? But uh, if we think that the technology is an enabler, so always support us, just like the water and the boat, you know, so even some people think that, okay, water, if the water level is high, maybe this will drown people, right? But actually, if water is going high, and we can go even higher because we are on the boat. So I think that's uh, my understanding of technology. Okay, and what about you, Doctor Nguyen? What does technology as the enabler mean to you? Uh, hi, thank you for uh, inviting me to the show. That, yeah, I think my colleagues say all the things that I want to say, but from my perspective, I I just want to have another uh, thing to add. Like, yeah, technology is an enabler, but not the solution. So I think people are also the key of any solution. We just use the technologies and the materials to build our solutions. So, yeah. That is a great addition. And I love everything that you guys have said today. And for me, technology as the enabler means that we do what we already do at a faster and a more efficient way. I'm someone that also grew up without technology until I was 19 years old. My first cell phone, I was 19. So my education didn't have YouTube, it didn't have tablets, it had the old school version of an Amstrad computer using the DOS systems. And we had encyclopedias, as I said earlier. Nowadays, and during the pandemic, we've understood how critical technology has been to get us further, but also life in general. Without technology, we wouldn't have been connected. So technology for me enables me to be connected to more people. And from a business perspective, it allows us to share our message across the world in a global manner in a much faster way. And this was a very powerful start for our panel. So now let's talk about data something that you're all very passionate and knowledgeable about. So I want to dig deeper because there is no learning without understanding data. Data is one of the most powerful tools to inform, to engage, and to create opportunities along an educational journey. So with your expertise, I want to better understand why is data so important, not just in education, but in other areas as well. So let's start with Dr. Jamal, because you are a member of multiple academic journal boards and data is something you bring. I would love to have your insights to the question of why data is so important from your management and business analytics point of view. Right, so uh, in most fields involving applied, applied research, uh, having access to data is the only way to expand the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, provide that obviously that we we have the tools to exploit it, and uh, in in most cases we are talking about descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive uh, analytics toolboxes uh, that we use to extract intelligence from the data. Uh, for the sake of uh, uh, expanding our, our knowledge uh, on a, the sort of unit of analysis we are looking into, but also for the sake of uh, uh, better decision making as a result of uh, uncovering or revealing uh, information that uh, without such tools uh, would not or the analysis of the data would not uh, be able to have access to yeah so uh, uh, that's uh, from the importance why why data is important the, the, the problem we are actually facing, uh, both in academia and in and uh, practitioners are facing the same issues, is the availability of data. 
uh, and ideally uh, one day I know that the project is going on but uh, hopefully one day we will be having open access data hubs uh, to democratize basically uh, research because a lot of people all around the world academics researchers here and there they they can't afford they can't have access to data and therefore their uh, uh, the, the scope of their research is very limited because of this uh, lack of uh, access to data. And, and so far, uh, the data providers are uh, charging uh, uh, large amounts of, uh, of money uh, to, uh, to institution, higher education institutions, for example. Uh, so hopefully the governments uh, uh, all over the, the world through probably some some data organization will come together to fund uh, uh, data hubs that will be open access and uh, uh, democratize actually the the use of data and and research that's a great answer uh, and I would now love to talk to dr Nguyen because when it comes to data, you are a big advocate of taking control back of your data. So could you please share more on what that means and your viewpoint then on the importance of data? Dr. Nguyen? Your microphone is mute. Yeah, sorry, I'm mute. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, right. so, so yeah, actually uh, taking back personal data to the real owner is one of my research interests in Imperial College. And I'm working on the developing a platform to ensure data privacy as well. And yeah, I believe data, or to be specific, personal data, is becoming a digital asset. It's not a freebie anymore. Data has value. And, you know, personal data is a vital factor. And power today online service providers is simply like a fossil fuels or electricity in the engine system. So yeah, personal data is very, very important. And when did your, could you explain a little bit more in regards, where did your passion come from or what made you start that research on taking control back? Because this is a topic that is uh, very fresh or a lot of people would love to understand uh, more because every day we share our data every day we load up uh, whether it's an email a picture a message so how, what can we do to get better and where does the studies come from and is there any papers for example that people could find uh, online of the things that you've written absolutely i published several papers about that and yeah i i think it comes from uh, the gdpr you know that the GDPR, the data uh, regulation in uh, protection in the UK and in the EU. And I mean, uh, previously many service provider can get our data freely. So we, for example, Facebook, we provide them a lot of personal data and they totally control our data. They can share our data with other parties without our awareness, right? So that behavior is not acceptable because we are the real owner of the data, not the service provider. But currently, we don't have any mechanism to to do that, to ensure that Facebook, once they want to share our data, they have to inform us and they have to get our consent to share the data. So that's the motivation I, yeah, I take in to develop our platform to bring back the owner ownership to uh, to the real owner of the data. All right, th thank you for that. Now, Mr. Malik, from an entrepreneur's perspective, what insights can you give us to these questions as to why data is uh, so important? So, you know, um, I will give you, as, as you rightly said, I will share my view from a user perspective or an entrepreneur perspective with, with my esteemed panelists being um, much more educated professors. I, I, I don't point the candle to them. Uh, the the way we look at from a data perspective is that if we are delivering high quality education using technology or tech as an enabler, 
how do I use uh, machine learning, AI, and a lot of data around student behavior? How do I use the data around the learning experience of the student? How do I ensure I get the data about uh, how much he or she has learned? Uh, that level of intelligence, that level of data flowing back to us, that level of data coming back to us in terms of ensuring that if we are teaching X, the student is understanding X. I think to me, that's the power of data as a user or as an entrepreneur. And if we are able to build those models, build those algorithms in terms of so that learning for each individual can be unique at the time while it is being delivered to thousands of the people at the same time, but the data is coming back in terms of how each one of them is learning. Um, to me, that's that's Nirvana. That's where we want to go. That's where the uh, the beauty of the setup is, where where each one of the students sitting among thousand students will feel that they are getting they are being taught something unique, and it is being customized to them. And all this can only happen if we are able to attract or or um, get the data about their learning behavior, about their understanding, about their through through the surrogate measures and quickly kind of you know process it and then adapt our learning mechanism basis that so in my mind as a user as an entrepreneur that's how i look at the data okay thank you so much mr malik and i do have a follow-up then on this because from that entrepreneur's uh mindset from that experience that you have where do you place for example artificial intelligence or emerging technologies when it comes to data what is I your think that. I think that's that's going to be the bedrock. That's going to be the the foundation on which uh, you know a lot of things would be uh, would be built. As of now, it's all um, rudimentary. When I say rudimentary, where we should be uh, at one stage, you are talking of driverless cars. One stage, you are talking of you know airports traveling in a you know traveling in a vacuum. Uh, those kind of technological innovations happening all all around us. How do we ensure that the um, you know, in, in the ed tech world, how do we use AI and machine learning to, to, in my mind, if we are able to enhance the learner experience and give them the experience which is unique to each learner, because all of us are different, at the time while managing the scale, to me, that's where AI and machine learning and the algorithms will play a larger role in adoption of ed tech. There can be other efficiencies in terms of, um, you know, uh, getting the process efficiencies and operation efficiencies of the company right. But that's more internal to a company. But to a larger perspective, I think the first one in terms of getting the learner experience right and getting the, um, the scalability aspect of it can only happen by using, um, you know, extensive uh, real-time data uh, coming in while the, while the teaching is happening, quickly processing it, adapting the delivery real time to make sure that each one of uh, us gets a unique experience is the way to go. I hope everyone listening is paying attention to the golden nuggets these panelists and share are sharing. And Mr. Malik, yes, I completely agree in regards that everybody, uh, you mentioned something, everybody learns at different paces. Everybody's brains is different. And I believe emerging technologies, machine learning, uh, education, the way that we're learning can now be more inclusive as well. Because how many times in a classroom you have the ones that get everything in two seconds and the people that are always lagging behind, not because they're not intelligent, but because their brain processes in a different way. So if we can now have a more inclusive technology way, technological way, of making education better uh, for me, that's definitely a plus. And that leads me to then ask Professor Sion, you have a vast background in education, having worked at many leading universities over the past few years. So from that point of view, from your educational background, why is data so important in education? Uh, well, I think um, uh, for education side we need to monitor the quality of uh, the, the the teacher and also the student so both need the data so uh, like mo every single uh lecture or professor in the uk so we need to 
submit the performance data. The data is, is to evaluate how students perform. And, and of course, we can also tell from the data how good the, the lecture will perform. Of course, before, uh, without uh, big data, so we manage small scale, but now we manage larger scale because of the uh, artificial intelligence and um, machine learning. And uh, we can give, uh, I think other panel colleagues already mentioned that we can give a uh, customized um, uh, uh, solution to thousands of people. Online teaching, online learning, many universities already provide them uh, many online uh, modules and manage thousands of people in, in, in one module uh, with tailored uh, 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 provisions. So basically, uh, I think um, uh, this will provide more fair education opportunities uh, to, you know, tailor-made for students will greatly improve the students. But, uh, you know, before, it's only for some very rich uh, people, you know, who can afford that to attend some uh, uh, very uh, private education, uh, private schools. Um, but uh, now, so this tailored made teaching can can be provided to many more people. Many more students will be uh, monitored. So yeah, I think it's very great for the education fairness. Yeah. So so that's my opinion. That's why data is uh, important for to the student, to the teacher, and actually also important to to the university or schools, you know, so, so people will compare them. Actually, just uh, while we are talking, I got a, 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 a email notice from the university jump out from my window to say, okay, so uh, at my university uh, ranked uh, 60, 61, 661 of the global ranking in impact by times higher, just, uh, just two minutes ago. It, because that we submit the data for all the uh, 17 SDGs and every university compete by the 17 measures and uh, and then they they can compare with each other compete with each other improve or compete with themselves to improve you know so with the, there are more than 1000 and 100 universities already participated in this global ranking so uh, well that's why data is very good for for your self improvement and also to, to know, know, know more about yourself, yeah. How, how fortunate we are that we are joined by these incredible panelists who are so powerful. And as I mentioned, their names uh, are on the chat comments. So you can Google and see the papers they've written because combined, they do have hundreds of journals, papers, and information when it comes to data, education, technology, uh, business analytics. And of course, it is impossible for me to try to capture even a 10% of what they all do. Uh, but that moves us to the next question, because although data is extremely important, as we've just heard, so is security and privacy. So this question is addressed to all of you, because I want your different points of view. So when it comes to having policies and open communication about data, can you share your thoughts on how you personally handle this topic? Let's start with Dr. Jamal. Right, well, uh, security and privacy are, are important to all. So uh, the issue here is the, in my opinion, is the lack of uh, proper legislation to ensure uh, security and privacy. Uh, and this is one of the solutions, obviously, there are uh, different uh, possible solutions, but this is one of the solutions that I, I believe is rather urgent. Obviously, uh, uh, some might argue that we already have legislation, but in uh, reality, it only protects providers and does not uh, properly protect uh, the users. So um, I think uh, there is a, there is definitely a lack of uh, <coughs> proper legislation. This is an area that needs to be strengthened in terms of uh, of legislation uh, to to move forward, and uh, also uh, to to make sure not only it's, uh, it's a matter of of privacy, but he, now with the uh, with the the world of banking uh, uh, moving uh, moving online. The risks uh, of fraud are, are much higher than they used to be, 
and uh, we, we need we, we need uh, a proper legislation here because even though the banks are not necessarily talking about uh, uh, about uh, issues related to fraud, but they they spend a fortune every year uh, as a result of of fraud. Uh, so uh, this is a, this is a serious issue that needs to be to be addressed by uh, by legislation and reinforced by pro proper uh, uh, cyber uh, security agencies. Correct. Cybersecurity is actually a major topic that I think sometimes feels undervalued. Uh, I speak often to a couple of cybersecurity experts who have always told me. At least nothing is ever 100% secure, but we need to prevent. Prevention is key in any organization. And just like Dr. Jamal said, we need to have more policies. We need to be more involved because as we all know publicly, it's only once a breach has happened that an organization decides to actually take matters into their own hands or to dedicate a budget for cybersecurity. And it's only bigger companies that tend to be more aware uh, of these factors, such as Fortune 500, uh, education, government offices. But what about the smaller person? What about the startups, the SMEs, anyone who does not understand cybersecurity? And this is where I believe education, once again, comes into play without understanding the importance of security, privacy, and having policies in place. How on earth can we expect people to get better? So now I would love to have the insights from Dr. Nguyen, if you may. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. Like, I agree with uh, Professor Jama, like current, uh, at the moment, um, I think they, Try to focus the uh, security and uh, privacy of data to service provider, not to the end user, not to the real owner of the data. We have to change that behavior. So actually, the GDPR in the UK and in the EU are already characterized that. So they try to limit the the power of the service provider and they try to bring back more control to the owner. But the thing is, we don't have a mechanism that to do that. So it requires more research to provide the real uh, ownership to the end users. And you know that uh, uh, exposing personal data to the public can lead to uh, very dangerous situations for the owners, right? We need to protect that. We need to prevent that uh, data breaches. And, you know, leaking sensitive information to unauthorized party will heavily affect the owner's comfort. And as well as it's also wipe out the attitude towards the digital services. So in this way, the, the lack of trust in uh, uh, handling personal data could uh, discourage uh, end users to involve in providing data for service provider and in using such kind of services. So in this manner, if you want uh, the service like the AI or machine learning uh, services to reach their full potential, data security and privacy is the most important aspect we need to deal with. Correct, I definitely agree uh, with what you've said. Cyber security, once again, uh, we need to put it at the forefront, I believe, of any planning. And I think sometimes what I find is that it's put at the bottom of these uh, categories simply because it's not understood or because I believe it is still quite new. Cybersecurity is one of the only industries that currently has zero percent unemployment. And by that, it means right. that we don't have enough experts. We don't have enough experts in this field. We can all try to do our best, but we need to encourage more younger people to also enter this field. Now, what are your thoughts, Professor Sion? Uh, how do you handle this topic at uh, the current university uh, you are at? Thank you. Actually, interestingly, uh, just before this panel, uh, I. I uh, organized a meeting uh, between 
our university cybersecurity uh, center, the director, and uh, with uh, the director of uh, another big player in this field, now create a lot of uh, publicity, which is Huawei. So, so basically, uh, I, I am in this meeting. I bring two parties together to discuss this issue because uh, if uh, Huawei do not pay a lot of attention to privacy or data, so as an international player, so they may the technology may may suffer, may may not be adopted by many countries. It's not good for technology, so they have to pay attention to this. And now we're discussing some more transparent uh, model uh, to make the technology uh, as some of our early discussion as an enabler. It's not a, we we should make it a transparent uh, enabler, and uh, it cannot be used as uh, uh, some black box or some weeping even. So we, we clearly know uh, how this uh, mechanism, the applications, uh, the technology is is developed. And uh, so we can we can see every part of it. So so this is what why we want to achieve. This is uh, how, uh, what our cybersecurity center uh, want to achieve. So uh, basically, I think um, uh, as a university, we uh, we have been quite uh, good in uh, this era, so we have very strong uh, 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 research and also in the industrial impact. Uh, so, for example, we have the largest 5G research center uh, in Europe, so basically rank, rank number one across Europe. So all the 5G standard, whatever, whichever the, 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 the mayor, so we're still the largest and the most influential. And we also have a, a center for computer vision and speech. So also it's an AI center, machine learning. So it's uh, also rank number one in the UK, so in the latest uh, uh, ranking. So uh, because that, uh, I think um, our university pay a lot of attention to how to make good use of the new technologies, you know, AI and 5G rely on data. And uh, we support uh, many uh, uh, industry leading players uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, sector, uh, and uh, we make good use of them. Uh, and the data, uh, if we do not manage the data or if research it properly, we will cause some ethical problems. So uh, I still remember when I was working for University of East Anglia. So we're, you know, the very notable. Uh, thing about the data leak, about the climate change, you know, that create the, the data for climate change, you know, University of Sangha is uh, basically the center for the world for the climate change data. And uh, so basically, uh, it's a huge problem uh, if how we manage the data, make good use of the data uh, properly. Yeah. So I do think that um, um, uh, with new technology, new standards, new regulations, the data will eventually uh, more shift back to the users. Uh, so um, uh, I think uh, like we use uh, blockchain technology. So many more blockchain technology. Uh, so for example, one of the platform that uh, my university is associated called Data Swift. Basically, we work with the big players like uh, Facebook, and like many others, uh, that we give them agreement, a uh, smart contract. So we we will provide the user's data, okay? So instead of stay, uh, storing the data, centralized storing the data with uh, uh, the IT giant you know, or the big players, instead we provide a decentral, decentralized database to store the user's own data. So using uh, the, the blockchain technology and the relevant technologies. So this will be the trend and to, for, for the next uh, uh, generation of technologies. Thank you. This is uh, such an in-depth answer, and this is what I hope the audience is paying attention to. Uh, extremely powerful insights. And you also mentioned uh, one uh, tech brand, one Chinese tech brand, which is Huawei, uh, a company that I'm also extremely familiar with. And I've personally visited two of their cyber security centers, uh, one in Shenzhen and uh, the second one in Brussels when they opened two years ago. So I am aware uh, the perception, especially that we have in Europe, 
of tiny tech company sometimes that they may not be as secure and how they are trying to expand now. And for example, doing the collaboration such as your university so that they can get a better understanding as to how uh, in Europe uh, they can do it better or so that they can have a perception. From everything that I've learned from them, uh, they put a lot of effort. There is a lot of uh, R&D budget that goes into cyber security, but not many people actually uh, understand that. I remember having a conversation with one of their executives. Uh, I had a one-on-one, -on -one, a whole hour to talk about just cybersecurity of Huawei. And uh, I must say I was quite impressed in how much knowledge and how much certification they had, but I don't think the world understands what that means. And once again, it comes down to education, doing collaborations with more people, Universities are such a key part of emerging technology collaborations. So I definitely want to see more of that. And we've got one person left in the room, Mr. Malik. Could you please give us further thoughts on uh, handling this topic of open policies on cybersecurity, privacy, and data? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And I think. Um... You know, a lot of it has been said, and it has it has been covered by my um, esteemed panelist. I think the key again, you know, I'll give you one example where um, where we we got stuck. So we developed a technology that while a student is going through a lecture, uh, like like we are going through in this panel online, using the facial expression, we can come out with the engagement score in the class in the format of a graph and actually see that what is the exact engagement. So when the when the professor is delivering the lecture, at what point the engagement goes up, what point the engagement comes down, so that we can collect that data and map the data and say what topics people are finding interesting, what topic they are not finding interesting, where are they getting stuck, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we developed that, we deployed it. The first question, you know, which uh, we got stuck was that we are capturing the facial expression of a student. What kind of privacy laws um, it comes into in terms of across different geographies, you know, with uh, with the European laws being different, US laws being different, Indian laws being different, etc. So I think and, and the heightened sensitivity due to in the past with the Facebook leaks, WhatsApp issues, privacy, Google all that all that thing we, we hear so we had to put that on hold not because it was not good and the faculty appreciated it student appreciated it but we did not know the clarity around the laws which control that and and uh, as as uh, some of the panel members were saying that ultimately we we are trying to build a model where we give a choice to the user to give us rights to uh, you know use that and all that is very easy but there are other laws in terms of you know you capture the data what do you do with that data later what kind of laws around that unfortunately there is no clarity around it so while one side companies like us are working on the models to capture the data around the learning experiences and learning quality uh, we are not able to use that effectively because of the lack of clarity around the data privacy laws. So that's how I, I view that. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely understand the point of the clarity. And I think this applies to so many business and so many sectors without focus, without clarity, without uh, understanding. Uh, we've been mentioned GDPR. Europe is full, it is not even clarified on how GDPR works. Yeah. Then you bring other countries and they have no idea what that is. So that is the beginning, but many of us still are unsure as to how you expand it, for example, to other markets where there are many business owners. Uh, the bigger companies, once again, understand it better. It is always the smaller guy because they don't have the right knowledge. Would you agree on that, Mr. Malik? Uh, say that again, sorry. That would you agree that is because of the yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely with you, with you, with you there. Exactly. So now, uh, although we've touched on research, I want to dig deep in one question here. Because without research, we are unable to move forward in the development of understanding data. So let's just start with Dr. Nguyen. 
at the Data Science Institute at Imperial College, one of the world's leading universities, you have been very active, as you mentioned, in projects related to GDPR compliance solutions. So what role does research play in your current environment? Mm, all right, I, I think uh, it's obvious that in order to move forward in any subject, we need to do research, right? And in the development of the understanding the data, I believe you are referring to some kind of AI and machine learning technology. And yes, research is almost, I mean, important factor in order to provide more efficient and effective algorithms and mechanisms to uh, better understand data and also to support make, uh, making decisions uh, better. But the thing is, not only that, uh, AI or machine learning technology, in order to uh, make a solution uh, better, we need to have other technologies to develop as well, along with the AI and uh, machine learning. Like we have big data, we have sensor uh, deploys, and all, all over the world, we collect that. a lot of lot of data. And we have uh, we need to have high performance computation. Like we have more research topic on quantum computing, for example, or we need to have a better network communication, like 5G or 6G, in order to, you know, in order to uh, uh, enable the AI and machine learning work. And uh, obviously, data privacy and security is the most important, is the fundamental aspect if we're talking about AI and machine, uh, machine learning service Thank providers. So yeah, Thank you. Short, we need to develop not only one specific technology, but we need to have other technologies in order to support that technology to work. So in, uh, in our data science institute, we not only focus on uh, machine learning and AI alg algorithm, but we also uh, uh, research on a variety of uh, technologies that support AI and machine learning. Since you are an expert on uh, GDPR, uh, I see a question uh, from the audience, which is, could Cambridge Analytica happen again? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I, uh, I, believe, I believe, yes, data breaches happen everywhere and every time. I believe in, uh, in the current practice that data it's collected and gathered into a big, a very big data center, like the Facebook uh, data server or Google data server, that will happen soon or I don't know, but yeah, that will happen. So in order to do that, like I agree with uh, Professor Sean, like we need to decentralize that kind of behavior, that kind of collect all the data into a one, big center, we need to de decentralize that. Correct, and definitely will breaches happen again? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. If anyone, to be honest, if there is any person out there that says no, uh, I'm sorry, but no. Uh, breaches will happen. We're not here to bring solutions that are gonna be 100% effective. When it comes to cybersecurity, compliance solutions. This is a very complex subject and we are years from finding the perfect version, but we can do our best through research. And just like somebody else is uh, saying on the comments, data is the most valuable uh, resource. This is what we're talking about today and it definitely is something that we must continue. And now Mr. Malik, I want your insights here because you have meticulously built a team on the basis of their core expertise and their determination to work with passion. So I can imagine that at Talent Edge, research may play a different role. So can you share with us what role <coughs> research play for you? So it's a, it's a critical component for us as a, as a business. It from right from figuring out what kind of courses we need to structure to ensure that uh, you know the demand from corporates is there to hire those kind of people to first figure it out what are the jobs for the future 
um, how do you deliver those courses how do you structure those courses what is the kind of curriculum needed for that that's one aspect of it the business research side of it second aspect is the the changing student behavior changing behavior of a working professional how is it changing what are they expecting uh, we have seen a drastic shift from uh, long lectures to a micro learning you know and then again it goes to now it's all about audio learning learning through audio so these behavior patterns are changing so fast how do we ensure that we constantly research so that we we um, uh, you know we kind of are ahead of the game and are able to um, package that and deliver that experience to our student and our learners so that's that's how we look at uh, the research right from kind of courses to delivery to ensure that the student behavior is captured uh, and to make us to keep us ahead in the game that is a very clear and concise uh, answer. Now let's move on to Professor Sion. It is my understanding that research plays a crucial role in your environment. You have a focus as well on sustainable and technological issues, and you have been published in many international uh, journals, uh, the same as uh, the esteemed panelists today. So can you share the importance of research for you? Sorry, importance of research. I didn't hear the last part. Can I repeat okay. the question? Yes, sir. Uh, the importance of research uh, for you when it comes okay. to yeah, the yeah. development. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, of course, uh, data is a uh, uh, very important tool uh, to our research. Uh, without data, we cannot do any research. Uh, just, uh, I think you talk about my latest publication. Uh, with literature communication, so it's one of the journal by by literature very high impact. Uh, so we collect the data about actually we talk about the decentralization, talk about blockchain. Actually, my 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 latest research is about the blockchain, and I talk about the data that we get from the Bitcoin mining, and we every single Bitcoin, Bitcoin we know where it mining from, and we notice that uh, more than 75 of the Bitcoin actually now op operates within China. So they saw after we get all the information and we found that um, um, more than half of the global uh, carbon emission caused by Bitcoin mining is from China. And the carbon emission already exceed several countries in Europe, mid-sized countries. This is our uh, funding and we talk about um, uh, how this will lead us to if we continue like this. Uh, so, uh, for example, by 2024, this the emission will be more than the whole Australia because based on historic data, we, we, we also combine many uh, factors. And uh, actually, uh, with data, the research can have a root, can be strong, can be influential. Without the data, so everyone can say that uh, oh, carbon emission is uh, uh, is important and uh, we have uh, already uh, a lot of emission we should uh, do, uh, stop something stop stop or, or change the policy for Bitcoin mining however uh, many people talk about this but they don't show data that's a problem so that's why our research uh, since we as a, according to the uh, uh, leisure.com so now we have 120 global press reported our research you know so it's uh, uh, rank uh, uh, the first of all the publications in the seminar age in this journal. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think uh, yesterday I saw the statistic. Also, data interesting literature track every single article published by uh, its uh, uh, journal and uh, also the series uh, that uh, uh, they tracked about uh, 200,000 publications. Yesterday I checked. Uh, of the 200,000. So it's interesting to know everything about your data, you know. So even say, before you do research, you check data, you, you develop research based on data. After that, you still have data. You can check how many papers cite your publication. You can uh, also see how many press reported. We find out of 120 uh, press, BBC, CNN, Forbes, every single press you could think of cited our research. Uh, and also uh, ranked, of 219 of all the 200,000 uh, uh, papers. It's all automatic. 
So because all the data that they track, you can clearly know how you position, how influence is your research, and uh, uh, you you will feel that the, the instant feedback from the big data, you know, so can encourage you to do many things, make your work more visible, create more instant impact. You know, so I think uh, uh, the data is uh, that's why data is important. That's why I I focus on blockchain, uh, and uh, of course nowadays. Even more new models devised, like the NFT, long fractive token, you know. So that will again completely change the the, the information society, and uh, everything will become data. Even our our paintings will become data, you know. So and the original painting will no longer that worth, you know. So worth less money than the digital one because of the. Uh, the the NFT uh, te technology or concept. It's not. I, I don't think it's a very complicated technology. It's just a new way of using the technology. Uh, so I just think. Um, uh, uh, so while we use the data, we will of course people. If even say they legally have access to the data, we still think that whether they should use it decently. Yeah. So after you get the data, you know your customer. And uh, you will know how to get money out of the customer. Well, so that's why some platform, actually, even some platform in China, they notice that they offer different price to different customer. You know, and uh, that's not very good. We, after we get the data, we should define how to better use that. Some customers, as a return customer, they are charged much higher because the system know this customer loyalty to them. They can charge higher. You know, so it's unfair. So that's why I think uh, uh, how to use data is, uh, and uh, whether to use or how to use and how much data we use is very, very important. And uh, uh, the, the regulation of using it, and, uh, and even say you don't uh, break the law, but uh, you use this to, to squeeze money okay, out of some customer. It's, uh, it's, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, fair and this should be regulated. Yeah. That's Thank my... you for your in-depth answer, and uh, you've mentioned uh, so many keys. Please continue to write uh, your papers and the research you do, because I did read uh, a couple of the recent ones, and they're full of in-depth knowledge. So I encourage everyone to please research the papers that these incredible panelists have written if you want to get a deeper understanding of these subjects. And the same question for Dr. Jamal. Your research portfolio is very extensive. It encompasses a broad range of applications and a variety of research methodologies in predictive and prescriptive analytics. So what role does research play in your case, in your current environment? Well, uh, I think my colleagues covered the data issue and the importance of the of of the data. Uh, we also covered the importance of the toolboxes of descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics for uh, exploiting actually that data when we have access to. Uh, in terms of the, I think I will I will cover uh, uh, things from a slightly. Uh, uh, different uh, angle. Uh, we are uh, working in uh, myself and my colleagues in uh, uh, highly ranked uh, 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 universities. Uh, uh, University of Edinburgh is one of the top 25 in the world and Imperial College as well. Uh, the uh, in, in the UK context, uh, as opposed to other contexts, uh, we have a, a, an annual review, uh, a, a review uh, each five years of the universities. Uh, and one of the important components in that review uh, is the research outcome of the universities and therefore of uh, its staff. Uh, so it goes without saying that uh, research is extremely uh, important for us. Uh, that's one of uh, uh, our main activities alongside, obviously, the, the teaching. But uh, uh, for from a personal perspective uh, uh, and for reputational uh, 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 
from a reputational perspective, uh, the research remains very important. Uh, however, here we are still thinking uh, in terms of uh, personal uh, objectives, in terms of research. We are talking about uh, uh, university objectives in terms of research for the sake of rankings and, and funding from governments uh, and other organizations. But the, what we uh, rarely talk about is uh, the importance of research and the importance of transforming the outcome of, of research into actually products and services that are commercialized for the sake of uh, 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 enhancing the economy. Uh, and I think this is one of those things that uh, uh, obviously governments are aware of this, but not all governments uh, uh, do uh, invest in these aspects of uh, not only uh, research uh, or production of research, but also commercialization of that research. And uh, uh, yeah, so this, this is another important uh, 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 aspect of the research. Uh, and we can clearly see that in uh, uh, research intensive environments uh, and, and countries, obviously they are where they are because or the, and their economies are where they are because of the uh, that step that they take uh, uh, to commercialize uh, or to put in practice actually the what, what comes out of the of, of universities in terms of research thank you uh, thank you professor jamal and with that uh, we have four minutes left we have come to the end of this panel and I do have one last quick fire question for everyone. I also want to say thank you to the people leaving comments. Uh, any question unanswered, please feel free to tweet it or send a LinkedIn message to the panelists if you would like it to answer. But for today, my last question to all is what is the one key takeaway you would like everyone to remember about education technology or Tech as the enabler, Mr. Malik. A great leveler, you know, somebody, something which um, takes the quality education to masses. It's a great leveler. Thank you, Professor Siong. What is your takeaway? Professor Siong, we cannot hear you. Uh, some mouse. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I think your question is about uh, using one one, one, one key takeaway for everyone to remember about education, technology, or tech as the enabler. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, uh, uh, this uh, edutech will provide the uh, fairness, you know, so to for all the people. Yeah. So we 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 want more more people get a fair education, fair opportunity, and the technology can help. Us achieve that. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Jamal? Well, I, I believe in the long run, uh, tech will enable us to do, deliver better and learn better. But in, in the meantime, obviously, the relevant stakeholders would have to make the necessary investments uh, for learners uh, uh, to one day have their uh, teachers at home uh, whether, whenever they need them. And obviously, here I'm talking about the uh, Holograms and hologram projectors uh, as as an application actually of artificial intelligence uh, to enhance the learning experience and not only enhance it but customize it to the needs of of individuals. Thank you. And Dr. Nguyen, what is your takeaway for everyone? Yeah. So at tech, I think at tech enable uh, like twenty four seven access to learning. So try to use utilize them and try to craft as much knowledge as possible perfect thank you all for being big voices sharing powerful messages and taking action not just by talking the talk but walking the walk you are all very active members in the educational sphere it's been a pleasure sharing this virtual stage with you all and when it comes to technology as the enabler we just need more of what is already being done and we need to get more educated about how we can benefit from continued learning to shape a better future. I want to see more collaborations across the globe and more opportunities created for everyone. 
And before I go, I have a favor to ask to the audience. During the Open Business Council Summit, many golden nuggets are being shared on all the sessions. So what I want you to take out of this is that no matter what golden nuggets you feel are good or applicable for you, you have to take action. Make sure you go out there and implement what you learn and take action today. Thank you all for watching. This is Thank Alicia. You. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.